Well, good morning. Good morning. Welcome back to the other North Korean Baptist and friends. It's good to see you today and trust that you are doing well and you're blessed. We're appreciating that you are here with us and looking forward to another wonderful time of worship and service together today. So it's another beautiful Sunday. Spring is coming and we get reminders of that every once in a while. And we keep praying for it to come sooner rather than later. But the Lord, in his good time, will provide for all of us. And so thankful for that as well. Today is a special Sunday. We will uh, partake together of communion, remembering what the Lord has done for us. And we will also have a uh, time special offering for our NAB Spring Missions offering as well later on in our service today. So looking forward to that opportunity. <coughs> Thank you for coming today, everybody. Good to see you. And trust that you are blessed this morning. I'm going to invite Zoe to come, and she's going to come and share with us a few announcements for us today. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Hope you're all doing well. Um, so, we have a prayer gathering today at 6 30 here at the church. Um, we will be start, um, starting a new Sunday school, right? Starting today. Okay. All right, um, and that is how to study the Bible for yourself. Um, we have the Act of Faith Bible Study. That's Tuesdays at 6.30, and we are currently studying Crash Course on Evangelism. Um, we've got our spring missions offering this morning. Later this month, Good Friday service at 7 p.m. And fr on Friday, April 15th, sunrise, breakfast and sunrise service and breakfast at 8 a.m. on Sunday, April 17th. Business meeting on April um, 24th, and that's Sunday. And then we've got a missionary visit as well coming up, and that's Rick and Debbie Barden, and they're going to be with us Sunday night, April 24th at 6.30. Um, please bring a dessert to share following the service. That's all I got. Thank you. Appreciate that. Yes, last week I hinted that uh, something special was coming, and that is the fact that the Bardens are going to be with us at the end of April. So finally got all that confirmed. And uh, the best time for them to, be, to meet with us, according to their schedule, is Sunday night, the 24th, at 6.30. So we'll have about a half hour, 45 minute service, be a light service, mainly for them to present um, what they've been doing for the past several years and what's going on in Cameroon with their uh, missions, medical missions uh, ministry there. And then some time for you guys, for all of us really, to interact with them and to get to know them a little bit and uh, pray for them following with a dessert social. So who doesn't like dessert, right? So looking forward to that, getting to see the Bardens once again. Got a chance to meet them back in Michigan about 10, 12 years ago. So looking forward to meeting them again. They probably don't remember, but that's okay. <laughs> um, I believe that's all for our announcements at this time, unless I'm forgetting anything this morning. There will be more details coming up next week for some other things. But uh, if you need anything, it should be in your bulletin, online, and in the calendar you receive. Let's begin our service with a word of prayer as our uh, praise team comes forward. Father, we thank you for this time together this morning that we can meet together as brothers and sisters in Christ to proclaim the praises of Jesus, the Savior, our Savior, the one through whom you have called us to be your sons and daughters. Through his death upon the cross, his resurrection, and our faith in him, we have eternal life, forgiveness of sins. We've been adopted into your family. For that, Father, we are eternally grateful. Today, as we hear your word read and uh, shared and message given, and as the songs are sung today, we pray that through that all, we will express our joy and our gratitude and our delight in who you are and all that you've done for us, allowing you to speak to us, to convict us, to bring us to repentance and confession if necessary, but to... Overall, give us greater confidence in who you are and in who you've called us to be because of Jesus. We thank you, Father, for this time. We thank you for the blessings that you've given to us. We pray, Father, that you be with those who cannot be here with us today, whether they be in a hospital or unable to leave home for whatever reason. We pray that you would bless them, encourage their hearts, heal them, and strengthen them today. We do pray, Father, for fellow churches in our community and fellow NAB churches around uh, our country and around the world, missionaries. And, of course, the persecuted church as well, Father. We pray that you would strengthen all of them. Help them to be fruitful in their ministry, focused upon the gospel, and standing firmly upon your word. 
knowing and trusting that you would provide for their every need. We thank you, Father, for your love for us. And we pray that you would be honored and glorified in all that is said and done today. In Jesus' name. Stand with us, if you would, please. We'll recite this morning together Revelation 5, 12, and 13 to begin our time of worship. In a loud voice they sang, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and grace. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea, and all that is in them singing, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. Jesus, name above all names, let us sing to our worthy Savior.
honor our king and worship him through the giving of tithes and offerings. And of course, today is our special offering as well for our spring missions. And the NAB is raising funds uh, as part of our uh, conference for reaching out to unreached peoples in Cameroon and Nigeria. So if you would like to give towards that project today, uh, please make sure you designate that on your offering envelope, at least how much you want to go towards that. And any checks written specifically for uh, the Spring Missions offering need to be made up directly to the church. And we will send one check uh, to the NAB for that. So thank you for offering um, your praises to God in this fashion, that people might come to know Christ. Gentlemen, you come forward. Thank the Lord for his evil students. Father, once again this morning, we are reminded of the fact that you have provided each day as a gift for us. And throughout each day, you continue to provide blessings, you continue to fulfill your word and your promises to us, to be with us, to provide for our every needs. Father, you've also called us as your sons and daughters to reach out to all the world. And while we all here might not be able to go physically, help support those who have and who will. We thank you for that opportunity. We thank you for those who do go to share the gospel, to create hospitals, to be able to share the gospel with people who are in physical and health needs, to be teachers, to lead churches, to plant churches, in a variety of other ways and means, Father, in which you've called people to serve, to share the gospel, to make disciples. We're thankful for that. We're thankful for the opportunity to serve, to give, we pray that you would take these offerings, Father, whichever they are used for and designated for. We pray that you would multiply them mightily for your name, the expansion of your kingdom. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, 
Each one had a harp. They were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, because you were slain, and with your blood you purchased men for God, from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands and ten thousand times ten thousand. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. In a loud voice they sang, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them singing to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. The four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. Scriptures tell us that this happens on an almost continual basis in heaven, from eternity past and will continue into eternity future as well. As God the Father is praised for sending His Son, for redeeming sinners through the death of His Son, who is the Lamb, Jesus, the Savior, the Messiah. He is the one who is worthy because He allowed Himself to go to the cross. He went to the cross willingly to take sin upon Himself, the sin that he did not commit, but the sin of those who have rebelled against him and his father. And in dying and rising again, he's purchased men for God. All those who have placed their full faith and trust in Jesus alone as their Lord and Savior, who offers true forgiveness and eternal life. From all over the world, from all over time, wherever we may be found, if we place our full faith and trust in what Jesus has done for us, we may find salvation and eternal life. We're a part of God's kingdom, we're part of His family. We get to serve Him both now and throughout eternity. There are many, many praises and much more that we could share about this passage and looking forward to getting into that sometime this year, but I want us to remember and to highlight the worthiness of Jesus. He knew no sin, and He became sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. So we come to this table remembering, acknowledging what Jesus did for us and why he had to go to that cross because we were sinners. We are sinners. But we are the redeemed who placed our faith in him. We come to remember his body, broken, bruised, and beaten. The God of very, very God who came to be born of a virgin lived a sinless and holy life that he might take upon himself sin so that we, as we trust in him, take on His righteousness. Through His blood that was shed, our sins are washed away. We are made white as snow, as the scriptures and the song reminds us. We are new creatures in Christ. And we come to this table as the family of God, united in Christ, our Savior. It's a time for us to examine our hearts, to see where we stand with the Lord. If there be any wicked way in us, let us confess and repent of that this morning and turn to Christ as our Savior, the one who heals and redeems. At this time, we'll call our elders to come as we each bow our heads and spend a few moments with the Lord in prayer, examining your hearts, thanking Him for His sacrifice. Gentlemen, when you're ready, you may come forward. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, this morning we come together to remember what you have done for us in and through your Son, Jesus. Lord Jesus, we remember what you, according to your word, endured upon the cross. The suffering and shame, taking upon our, yourself our gift, that we might be declared innocent and righteous in the eyes of the Father. 
We thank you for the opportunity to join you in service to add to the kingdom more and more through the proclamation of the gospel. We pray that this proclamation this morning would bring you honor and glory for you alone are worthy of all praise. We thank you for calling us to be your sons and daughters. We thank you for preaching the gospel to us that we might respond in faith knowing that you are Savior that in you we have forgiveness and eternal life. We pray that you would be honored and glorified through this time. In Jesus' name, amen. If you take your hymnals with me, please, and turn to hymn number 180, a song written to reflect the scriptures we've already read several times this morning from the book of Revelation, chapter 5. Worthy is the Lamb. Before we partake, let us sing once more to our Savior that He is worthy. We are thankful for what he's done for us. Stand with me. Uh, if you want the music, it is in the hymnal, 180. If you just the words, they are on the screen for you this morning. One time through this wonderful hymn today. <laughs>
we thank you and uh, it is only through grace and mercy that we uh, can uh, enjoy and accept this gift with Jesus' name. On the night Jesus was betrayed, in that final last supper during the Passover time, Jesus took bread and he broke it and he passed it around to his disciples. And he said, this is my body which is for you. Eat this in remembrance of me. Again, as our elders pass the cup this morning, time for meditation reflection on the blood that Christ shed for us on the cross, which washes our sins away. Jim? Brother Mike, would you thank the Lord for shedding his blood on the cross for our sins? Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you for this day, and we thank you for all that you have blessed us with. Most importantly, Lord, we uh, thank you for your sacrifice on the cross and shedding of your blood to wash our sins will be white as snow. We thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. As Christ's people, let us once again sing our praises for what he has done for us. Let us turn in our hymnals to 196. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from the man of his fingers.
those in need within our community, within our church and our community at large. So we take a benevolent offering as an opportunity to share Christ's love with others. At this time, I'll ask our ushers to go ahead and collect this offering.
Jesus is the source of life. He is the Son of God, the Messiah. John has been writing and sharing the unique signs and statements of Jesus, testifying to the promises of the Old Testament about who the Messiah would be, what he would do, so that they would be able to recognize him and fully believe in him. See, John is writing, once again, we remember this, to those who do believe, so that they might continue in their belief, and to those who are questioning or doubting, or who do not yet believe, that they might fully know with full confidence that Jesus is the Messiah, the one who offers forgiveness of sin, and eternal life, so that we would all stand firm in that belief. So for our message this morning, we have the Spirit, through the Apostle John, highlighting an event in which Jesus is properly and highly honored. This is so that we might understand the significance not only of the raising of Lazarus, but also of the triumphal entry, which we will look at next week as we move further in the chapter so that we can properly understand what it means to be fully devoted to Christ and show Him great honor in the process. So we see several things here, as you can see in your notes and on the screen if you're following along, but we're going to go several verses at a time this morning, rather quickly, a familiar passage for us, but I'm going to highlight several things. First of all, we see in verses 1 and 2 here about honoring Jesus, the occasion and the purpose of honor. As we study the Bible, we always want to look at what is happening? Where is it happening? When is it happening? So here we see that Jesus and his disciples are back in Bethany. Bethany is where Lazarus lived. Bethany is where Lazarus was in tomb. Bethany is where Jesus traveled to after learning about Jesus or Lazarus' sickness and eventual death. But after that, at the end of chapter 11, we see that uh, Jesus went off to another place to rest and retreat. Then he did another little tour through Galilee. And then he comes back to Bethany on his way to the cross. Jesus and disciples in Bethany. This is Lazarus and Martha in Mary's hometown. This is the last time Jesus was here, of course, he raised Lazarus from the dead. And so now they're back, and I think it's finally an opportunity for Lazarus and Martha and Mary to give a dinner in honor of Jesus and what he has accomplished in Lazarus' life. According to the other gospel accounts, this was Simon the leper's home who had been, of course, healed by Jesus because he couldn't be a leper if he was actually inviting people into his home. He wouldn't even have a home if he was still a leper. Apparently, this man had been healed by Jesus, and he also wanted to honor Jesus by throwing him a dinner, or more precisely, a banquet. We all like banquets, right? Wedding banquets, uh, receptions, you know, we, we love to get together and to eat and to party. That's exactly what was going on. Lazarus was also a guest of honor because Lazarus had the great opportunity of being the one who was raised from the dead. And so he, you know, is kind of famous now. People want to see him. So he's with Jesus. They're reclining near a low table on the floor, kind of a U-shaped table. They're, of course, at the head of the table, as was customary in those days. So this all suggests that this banquet was a lengthy time-consuming, they were there to relax and enjoy each other's company, to praise Jesus, to talk with Jesus, and just to spend time with him. A time and a place where good conversation could take place. It's rather striking here that Jesus' ministry would begin in John chapter 2 with a wedding feast. Remember that, where he turned water into wine? And now his public ministry is going to end as he begins his walk to the cross. And it ends with another banquet, feast, big supper. Ultimately, Jesus is going to share one more major meal with his disciples, in which he will declare that to be his last and full meal until the time of the arrival of the kingdom, when all the saints, all who have believed in Christ, and in God's promise of salvation through him, will get together the great marriage supper of the Lamb. That meal that we all look forward to, even today time when we will be with Jesus, reclining at the table, fellowshipping together with all the saints. Notice here that Martha is serving. Usually Mary gets the focus, and Jesus, of course, but Martha is also serving here. The language suggests that she is serving Jesus and Lazarus specifically. Of course, Lazarus is her brother, and Jesus is her Lord. She has great faith and had great faith in what Jesus could do, never expecting that she, he could actually raise her brother from the dead. 
but still had great faith and grew in that faith. This is a unique situation for Martha to be serving in because it's not her home. She should not really be busy about things, but she wants to honor Jesus in the way that she has been gifted to honor Jesus. Jesus and his dear friend, her brother, are there. They are being honored. And Martha is showing this unique honor to Jesus by serving him and her brother specifically. Very devoted service. So this is the occasion. This is the setting for great honor to happen. It's during this banquet for Jesus that Mary performs the great act of devo great devotion and honor. In verse 3, Mary took about a pint of pure nard an expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. Everybody knew what she did, and everybody would remember that. This banquet honoring Jesus is interrupted by an unusual yet worshipful act. This did not happen all the time, although to Jesus, I think it happened at least two other times. Mary, a sister to Lazarus, takes what is supposedly her most precious and valuable possession and pours it all over Jesus. Why do I say all over when John says on his feet? Well, the other gospel writers say that she poured it on his head, and so it would flow down his body. She would probably pour it on his head and just pour it all the way down to his feet. Which account is correct? Well, they're all correct, because that's what would happen. The Spirit doesn't make mistakes, and neither did the gospel writers. The point is the focus of the incident that they wish to draw attention to. John and most of the, and the other gospel writers always show Mary at Jesus' feet. Think about the last time that uh, Mary got together with Jesus. She fell at his feet, right? And what about the time when Martha was serving and Mary was there sitting at Jesus' feet listening to him teach. In the garden later after his resurrection, Mary will be there at his feet. The point is the feet, the service. The honor. Jesus will show that one of the ways the disciples can show great honor to him and to others is to wash each other's feet, to serve one another, to love one another. Washing feet is a job for slaves, for servants. It's a nasty, dirty task. And anyone who did so willingly would be showing great love and admiration for them. And Jesus is going to teach that later on here in the next couple chapters. So John is foreshadowing what is to come, but at the same time, he is showing that service to Jesus is highly honoring to him. Serving one another within the church is highly honoring to Christ. So Mary takes what is extremely expensive and gives it all to Jesus. This perfume and the jar are both very expensive. Most likely a combination of around $3,000 in today's money. $3,000. $1,000. Think about that. In one moment, it was all given away. The jar was broken because that's how they did that back in the day. That's how you got perfume. You broke the jar so that it would smell and you know, the scent would go throughout the whole house. She broke it so that she could pour it all over Jesus. It's an absolutely stupendous event, except for the fact that it's Jesus who is the recipient of this costly gift. Anybody else would have been like, well, Judas is claim would have been probably relevant. But it's Jesus. It's the Messiah. It's the King of Kings. The Lord of Lords. The Savior. The one who will go to the cross. He is worthy of such an act of honor and devotion. Even beyond the financial significance of the act is the fact that Mary let down her hair to wash Jesus' feet. This is a scandalous and even possibly considered immoral act. Women who were honorable and never, never did this kind of thing, except in front of their own husbands. As far as we know, Mary is not married. So this is a highly emotional and physical outpouring of love and affection for Jesus. She shows no shame for her love, for her Savior. She is so deeply moved by who Jesus is, what he has done, and what he will do, that she is moved to worship him this most intimate fashion, to honor him to the extreme. She does not care about what others are going to think of her. She is only concerned about what Jesus will think, what Jesus will say, and that Jesus is honored. 
Mary is always found, as I said a moment ago, at the feet of Jesus in the Gospels, demonstrating what it looks like to honor Jesus, to fall at his feet, to worship him, to be humbled by his presence, to be ready and willing to give him everything of who we are and what we have at a moment's notice, without question and without shame. John adds a little detail here to remind us that he was an eyewitness to this. He was there. He saw this happen. And he knows that Jesus came to serve and not to be served. Yet those who truly know him will willingly give their all to serve him. Because he alone is worthy of this kind of extravagance. He will say to his disciples, if you're going to be my follower, you must be willing to hate everyone else in your life. Or at least your love for me will look like you hate everybody else in your life. And everything else in your life. Are you willing to give up everyone and everything for me? And in many cases around the world today, even in our country, that's what happens. Somebody turns to Christ by faith, and everybody deserves that. Except for the church, and sometimes even those who claim to be Christians. He alone is worthy of everything we can offer him. Mary's act of devotion and honor is noticed, of course. How could it not be noticed? You know, the fragrance is going to fill the whole room. You, you will remember this moment. In fact, in another Gospel account, Jesus says that she will be remembered whenever the Gospel is presented. So this act is noticed. But noticed especially in the cry of false honor. Verses 4 through 6. Judas, who would later betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages, $3,000. Think what we could have done with that money. But he didn't care about the poor. He was only looking for an opportunity to take advantage of being Jesus' treasurer. Here we have a cry from one who had already been betraying Jesus, John says, and the disciples. He used to pilfer, take from the money bag, take from Jesus' treasury whenever it suited him. He had already betrayed Jesus' trust. And that's just what sin does to us. We give in to temptation just a little bit every once in a while, and then eventually we're betraying Jesus and what he says to us. The exact opposite of devotion and honor. Judas, we're told, was Jesus' treasurer. He would steal from Jesus and the disciples on a regular basis. John and the Gospel writers always show Judas as a betrayer. There's no question. Mark will tell us that it was after this very dinner in Jesus' honor, that this, after this act of honor towards Jesus by Mary, that Judas will go to the authorities, he'll go to the Pharisees, and he'll make a deal with them, 30 pieces of silver. All right, I'll find a way to deliver him over to you. And that will happen in a week's time from this moment. This was the final act that drove Judas to betray Jesus. Ultimately and finally. He objects, and of course the other disciples do too, as we read in the other gospel accounts at this moment. The claim is that this should have been used for the poor, which there's nothing wrong with that. And Mary could have very well done that, and it would have been honoring to God. She would have been following the commands of Scripture. The money she would have received could have helped feed a few, though, for just a short time. In reality, though, Judas was masking his true intentions. He's a hypocrite. He doesn't care about the poor, unless he's thinking about himself, which he is. He's just wanting to hide what he has done and what he will do. He's looking better than he really is. He looks ultra-religious, yet his heart is far from Jesus and far from truly honoring him. He's all about himself and what he can get, not about what he can give, especially for the one who would die for sinners. Judas' cry is one of false honor. He doesn't care about Jesus or what Jesus stands for. Judas is one of those who was really hoping and ready to fight and die for a revolution that Jesus would lead. But Jesus was leading a different revolution against sin and Satan, not against the Romans. The cry of false honor, which leads to Jesus masterfully speaking to these incidents in the rebuke and recognition. This is where we really see what's been going on. Leave her alone, Jesus replied. Can you imagine that? Being rebuked by Jesus, one of the disciples, in this very intimate, very awesome, worshipful moment. And Jesus is like, leave her alone. (coughs) Gentle, yet 
with authority. Jesus tells Judas and the disciples, do not speak against me. How embarrassing for them to be called out in such a way in front of so many. These are Jesus' disciples, the ones who have been with him for so long, and they still don't fully grasp everything that Jesus has taught them. But it was necessary for Jesus. He's always ready to teach the true meaning of what is really happening. So he explains that this act of great devotion and true honor was right and good. This was good for Mary to do. This was above and beyond. Mary had been entrusted with this perfume, Jesus says, for one reason, that she would honor him. It was not an accident that Mary would have $3,000 perfume. God allowed it to happen. We know this because of the words intended and saved, or maybe in your translation, kept or keep. They all convey the idea that she had been chosen to guard, to watch over that perfume for just this moment. To honor Jesus and to show the one who is worthy of the honor and praise. So her great act of devotion and honor, she's also pointing out what's going to happen to Jesus. And Jesus takes the opportunity to remind them all, I am going to die. He's told them that several times. I'm going to the cross. My hour has not yet come, but it's coming. I'm going to go to that cross. I'm going to give my life. I will die, and I will rise three days later. Jesus is saying that Mary didn't sell the perfume on purpose, for it had been intended for a greater purpose to prepare him for burial. Something that the ladies don't actually get to do. The ladies who follow Jesus, who stay at the cross, they watch where Jesus' body gets buried in the tomb, Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea, they do some initial embalming and putting perfumes and spices on Jesus' body. But the ladies don't get to do that because when they finally get to the tomb, Jesus is gone because he's risen from the dead. This was Mary's only chance to honor Christ for what he would do and what he's done. It's an event kind of like Caiaphas' prophecy that one man should die for the nation, which is actually true. Jesus would die for the nation and it would benefit the nation. It's a spontaneous outpouring of love and devotion that prophesies what was to come so that they would know. This is a clue for John's readers that what was coming for Jesus was of great significance and worthy of great honor and devotion by them, by us. What Jesus would do makes him alone worthy of unashamed love, devotion, and honor. He's going to go to a cross, he's going to die on that cross, an innocent man for the guilty that we might have life by believing in why John wrote his gospel. It's why this passage is here for us, that we might fully, more fully, more confident believe in Jesus. Jesus is not teaching here we must understand that we should not give to the poor or never give to the poor. Jesus does say, the Bible does command, that we do give to the poor. We help those who are in need. But he's teaching that honoring him is the point of all that we do. In giving to the poor, in helping those who are in need, we do that, not just because people are poor, but because we're showing love to Jesus, and we're showing the love of Jesus that they, like Mary, would, like the others around there, would know and understand who Jesus is and what he does. Giving to the poor is a proclamation of the gospel indeed. Giving to the poor and other social outreach is fine and good, but without doing it for Christ, and to the point of pointing others to Christ, it's nothing more than a Judas cry of hypocrisy. We who are saved by grace through faith in Jesus and his death and resurrection, we are eternally indebted to Christ. We should make ourselves fully available for his service. All of who we are, all of what we have, no matter the circumstances. Are we ready to give what we are called to give? We will in fact help those who are in need in every way, but only as it spreads the fragrance of love and grace. That is what we want to leave them with. The love of Christ. I have been loved in a way that I did not deserve. Because this person who loves Jesus helped me. As with all of these events surrounding Jesus in this gospel and especially with what happened with Lazarus, we see again that there is some mixed results of honor. This great act of devotion and honor that maybe more than just in that house heard about, maybe more witnessed because it's such an extravagant and you know, indecent act of worship, but it is a worshipful, godly act of worship. In that day, it would have been shocking. 
But we read that there was a large crowd of Jews that found out Jesus was there, and they came not only to see him, but also to see Lazarus. Many people who know about or witnessed the raising of Lazarus discovered that Jesus is back in town. Hey, let's go see Jesus. Many of them come because they believe. What they've heard and seen about Jesus, they believe the signs, they believe the statements, they believe the acts. Many come because they want to see, is it true that Lazarus is really alive? You've got to be kidding me. No way, that didn't happen. That hasn't happened for a long time. You know, Elijah was the last person, or Elisha, they were the last ones to raise somebody from the dead. Many come to see a spectacle. Will Jesus do something else? What else could we see? But most of these people are going to be crying out to the Romans to crucify Jesus. In just a week's time. Jesus and Lazarus are gaining a following. Many people are coming. They're, they're seeing a spectacle. They're kind of like Judas, maybe some of them. They're like, ah, no, shh, whatever. It's gone here today, gone tomorrow. Some believe, but most do not. But there's enough people looking for Jesus and Lazarus that it gets noticed by the Pharisees. Remember, they told everybody in the end of chapter 11 that if you see Jesus, you've got to come and tell us we can go get it. Judas is the only one who does. There's a hit list now for with the Jewish leaders. Jesus and Lazarus. And eventually that hit list will grow. Stephen, James, Peter and John will be on there looking at rescue. There will be several martyrs for the faith reminds us that this world will turn against those who believe in Jesus and give him their full devotion and the honor that he deserves. There will be many who will claim they believe in Jesus, but when it comes right now to it, when they're challenged to give full devotion to him, they will walk away. May we be those who give full devotion and honor to Jesus because of what he has fully given to us. Because he is the worthy Lamb of God who died for our sins. So what does it mean to honor Jesus, according to this passage? We honor Jesus, first of all, I believe, by believing in him. We take him at his word. Mary took him at his word. Martha took him at his word. Yes, their faith expanded, but look at how far their faith came to. Look at where Mary and Martha end up. Serving Jesus in the ways that they are able and called to serve him. We honor him by believing in him for salvation. We honor him by believing in his word for how we are to live our lives. Every moment of our life is an opportunity to be fully devoted to Christ and to honor him with our choices, with our words, with our attitudes. We believe in him and take him at his word and serve him in ministry. We'll get to more about that in a moment. But let us remember the great honor it is to have somebody listen to us when we are in need, when we have something important to share, whether it's joy or sorrow, how we love when somebody else loves us by listening to us, how much greater honor is given to Jesus when we sit at his feet with his word in our hands and we study it, we consume it, as we learned about in Sunday school this morning, we read it, we honor Christ by believing in him and taking him at his word. We also honor Christ by giving him our very best. Everything we have has been entrusted to us for one purpose, to honor Christ. Everything we have. Think about that. The clothes you're wearing today. The vehicles you drove today. The Bibles you have. The jobs that you have. The opportunities to serve in ministry that you have. Everything is an opportunity to give Christ our very best because he is worthy of all honor and devotion. Our money, our stuff, our homes, our cars, relationships, all of it is given so that we would put it to work for Christ. We worship him, giving him our very best. Do we sing our very best? Not looking for professional singers. I love it when we make mistakes during our worship service. It might not look polished, it might not look perfect, it might make people turn away and walk out because it just looks like we're a bunch of buffoons. But we're just common, ordinary, everyday people who are loving Jesus the best we can. And we're going to make mistakes. We're going to miss a word or two or say the wrong name in a prayer. We're going to forget to bring our Bible to the pulpit. I've done that. <laughs> Forgive me. We're going to make mistakes. How we deal with them honors Jesus. 
Just move on. We are a gracious and forgiving congregation, and I'm so thankful for that. But are we willing to give him our all? Are we willing to sing out even if we can't sing very well? I mean, come on, I'm reading songs. If I can do that, we can sing, right? I'm no handy, by the way. We worship him by listening to his word. We worship him by giving our best in song, in prayer, by arriving on time. I'm not trying to make people feel guilty, but just think about it. What we give our time to is what's important to us. We make time. Accidents happen. Mistakes happen. We oversleep. The alarms don't go off. Things happen. I know that. They happen to me too. But are we striving to show Jesus and his church that we honor them by being here when the doors are open and giving our all through the time that we have together? Are we excited to be able to openly express how much we love Jesus? Are we taking advantage of every opportunity he's given us through his church to love him more and grow with him? We honor Jesus by serving him, especially serving him in his church. That is the number one way we serve Christ. Yes, we are to go out into all the world and make disciples, proclaiming the gospel, helping them to grow up in the faith. Yes, we are to do that, but we also serve one another they will know that you are my disciples by how you love and serve one another, Jesus says. He died for the church. Jesus loves the church. May we love the church. May we love serving in the church. May we not be afraid to serve because we're going to mess something up. Your pastor does it every single day, every single message, every single service. So either I'm really bad and need to get kicked out of here, or we all have no excuse. He died for the church. Let us find a ministry that will serve him and give it our all. Not begrudgingly, but because it's an honor to serve the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the Savior, the one who died, so I don't have to die. He suffered, so I don't have to suffer the wrath of God. Do we truly understand that? And is that expressed in our service? Find a ministry in the church. Give it your all for Christ. Even if nobody ever says thank you, because Jesus will. And that's the only thank you that truly matters. Not that we shouldn't say thank you when people serve us. We should. But if Jesus is the only one who says thank you, well done, good and faithful servant, that is worth it all. And finally, we spend time with Jesus. We honor him by spending time with him, kind of wrapping it all up. We make time for those that we love. What does our schedule say about our time with Christ? What do we honor most by giving our precious time to? We can never get a moment back. It's either used for self in a selfish, sinful way, or it's used for Christ. What do we arrive early for? What do we not care about being late to? What and who gets our full attention? Should it not be Christ and those that he loves? This is time is the one thing we never get back. Let us use it wisely for his honor and for his glory. Because he is the one. Father, we thank you for this passage this morning. We thank you for these truths. And we pray that you would write this upon our hearts, that you would convict us, that you convict me. May we give honor to Christ because he is due all honor and praise. Help us to think. Help us to put our lives into the perspective of what we do honors Christ or dishonors. May we take advantage of every opportunity, every tool, every good gift that you have given to us. May we utilize it for the kingdom, for Christ, that others might know him, that Christ would be proclaimed and worshipped, that brothers and sisters in Christ would grow in their faith. Help us to not be afraid. Help us to not feel ashamed, especially when we mess up. Help us to be thankful for your grace and your forgiveness and to move forward giving you our very we thank you for all that you've done for us, and we pray that you would guide us into honoring you in the way that we should be honored. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Take your hymnal with me one final time, please, and turn to 379. Take my life and let it be, may it be a life given fully for it to Christ. Verse 6, the final verse. Take my love for it, I pull it out.
this week to be ever holy all for Christ. Let us be reminded once again and accept our mission to go into all the world proclaiming the gospel. Let's recite together the Great Commission. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Father, we pray that you would dismiss us now with your grace and your peace, fully equipped and encouraged to go and to share the gospel, to make disciples, honoring Christ in all that we do. Bring us back together once again to honor you for who you are. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you for coming.